Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for an amazing time of worship where we do come before you, Lord Jesus, and we say thank you. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. Our hearts are filled with thanksgiving. And so this morning, I just pray that as we open your word, that it speaks to us, that it is not my words that are spoken, but yours, Holy Spirit. But prepare our hearts at the same time that we are ready to receive and then take it and apply it. Not just have faith, but to go and do what you've called us to do. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may take your seats. We had a great time away. How important it is for us to understand periods of rest, periods of restoration, renewing. And I think at times we go through cycles, don't we? We, we, tend, to, we tend to get into the rhythm of life. And sometimes when we get into the rhythm of life, we, we tend to just keep going and we stop and we forget to stop and pause to take a moment. I think we take for granted when we go on holidays and we have a couple of weeks off. It's just like, oh, I'm just going to allow my body to recover, my mind to not think about work or whatever the situation is. But at the same time, those things are good. But at the same time, we should be doing that fairly regularly. Taking those moments to stop and self-reflect. Take those moments of rest throughout the course of the week where our lives can become so incredibly busy. How often do we spend time just taking a moment? One, to declare how good God is. And secondly, to reflect, is there anything in me, Lord Jesus, that needs work? Create in me a clean heart, says the psalmist. How often do we spend time saying, Lord Jesus, create in me a clean heart? As I was on a bit of leave, I felt the Holy Spirit sort of just channel me towards the book of Judges. I've been sitting in the book of Judges for quite some time, and, and most of you will probably know the characters of the book of Judges. You, Deborah's, Samson, Gideon. Gideon, who was able to defeat an entire army with 300 men. Gideon, who thought he didn't really have a role to play. Samson, who was actually mentioned in Hebrews as one of the men of faith, who slayed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Deborah, who was an incredible judge over the people of Israel and didn't actually take credit for the victory, it was from another woman who drove a tent peg through the temple of their oppressor. The book of Judges, we know the characters, but do we know the application or the bigger picture? See, if, you've, if you know your Bible... The book of Judges comes after the book of Joshua. Thank you, all those Bible students in the room. After the book of Joshua is the book of Judges. Now, Mike has been spending the past couple of weeks speaking into the book of Joshua and the incredible achievements that happened through the book of Joshua. The Israelite people had been wandering around for 40 years in the wilderness under Moses and then they walked into the promised land and everything that they were doing prior to walking into the promised land was going around in circles. Then they walked into the promised land and God went before them and they moved forward. They started to move forward with everything because they were understanding of who God was and the victories that he would have before them. But as Joshua died and he passed away... There was a void that was left. And what happened was because of that void of leadership, the people started to unravel. See, what happens when we unravel is as this piece of cord is behind us, it's actually a piece of steel. These bits of steel, when wound together, hold up bridges. 
They tie together balustrades. They are incredibly strong. They are used for incredible strength. But it takes one little fray of a steel thread that can cause incredible damage. See, when things start to erode, when things start to unravel, it's incredible how quickly, if we're not on it, how quickly it can start to spiral us down. See, the people of Israel went from moving forward under Joshua, and then they went into another cycle, a cycle of depravity. See, what happens is in that cycle, they went from moving away from God, being under oppression. They then cried out to God. God would send a judge to deliver them. They were rescued, and then all of a sudden, they did the same process all over again. They went from moving forward to cycles. And then as you read the book of Judges, it goes from cycles to spirals. If you've got your Bibles, please turn with me to Judges chapter 1. We're going to go from verses 19 to 21, and then we're going to skip down to 27 to 23. So once you've found your passage of Scripture in Judges chapter 1, 19, please stand as we read the Word of God. One thing you'll notice about this church is we get up and down a lot. So if you're here for, here for a little bit of an extra fitness workout, you're going to get that this morning as well. Judges 1.19 says, The Lord was with the people of Judah, and they took possession of the hill country, but they failed to drive out the people living in the plains who had iron chariots. The town of Hebron was given to Caleb as Moses had promised, and Caleb drove out the people living there, who were descendants of the three sons of Anak. The tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. So to this day, the Jebusites lived in Jerusalem among the people of Benjamin. As we go down to verse 27, it says, The tribe of Manasseh failed to drive out the people living in Bethshan, Tanak, Dor, Ibliam, and Megiddo and all the surrounding settlements because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them completely out of the land. The tribe of Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites living in Giza, so the Canaanites continued to live there among them. The tribe of Zebulun, they failed to drive out the residents of Kitron and Nahal. So the Canaanites continued to live among them, but the Canaanites were forced to work as slaves for the people of Zebulun. The tribe of Asher, they what? They failed to drive out the residents of Acho, Sidon, Al Ahlab. I'm not going to say that one, and I'm going to skip to the less. Instead, the people of Asher moved in among the Canaanites who were controlling the land, for they failed to drive them out. In verse 33. Likewise, the tribes of Naphtali failed to drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh and Beth and Eth. Instead, they moved in among the Canaanites who controlled the land. Nevertheless, the people of Beth Shemesh and Beth Aneth were for forced to work as slaves for the people of Naphtali. Please take your seats. If we notice, there's a couple of key words that are used in nearly every verse that we read. Anyone got any clues? They failed to. They failed to. See, back in Joshua chapter 23, God had given Joshua a command to say to the people, whatever you do, when you move into the promised land, when you move into the promised land, there is going to be the Canaanites. Whatever you do, don't mix with them. Don't intermarry with them and don't worship with their gods. Essentially, Joshua was saying that the people that were already living there were living a very seductive lifestyle and as, as, if when, or as if God knew the hearts of the Israelites that when they would move into, them, into that land, it would be very tempting for them to look at that land and the way that that culture was operating and incorporated into their own world. God had made a specific commandment. Do not do that. Do not intermarry. Do not be a part of their world. 
But as we read, what did they fail to do? They failed to drive them out. God had said, drive them out so they're not a temptation. Drive them out so they do not cause you to stumble. Spiritual erosion, which is something that we're going to be speaking about today, can happen so subtly. Because what happens is when we decide to disobey or only partially obey the commands that God's given us, it can set us on a course not only of cyclic behaviour, but also a spiral to depravity. Now, Judges is a fairly extreme example of what this depravity might look like. If you were to go to the very end of um, of Judges, verses uh, 21, I think, out of uh, chapter 25, or 25, 21, it says that the people had no king, and so therefore they did whatever they wanted. So they've gone from uh, moving into the land, God clearing a path, making a way, moving forward to a people at the very end of the book with no king and pretty much just doing whatever they wanted. The nation of Israel was starting to unravel. There is one thing that I found when I was looking through this passage that, that happened. Spiritual erosion or the unraveling of a society and a culture, which we see in the people of Israel, didn't happen with something major. It was one thing that they did that they were not supposed to do. God said, clear them out. What didn't they do? They did not clear them out. They did not drive them from the land, and so therefore, they only did partial obedience, not complete obedience. God had said, do something, but they thought they would do something with their own will rather than the will of God. It's the same in our own lives. How often we allow things into our own lives that we think we can control, things that we think that we've got to measure on, things that we can keep a lid on. But all of a sudden, if we let that thing fester, if we let that infection grow, it can cause significant damage. Many years ago, before I was a landscaper and I had these hardened, calloused hands that are presented before you now, they've softened a little bit over the past couple of years, I must admit, but I was, and don't let this image cause anyone to stumble, but I was a swimming instructor. Get that, get that image in your head. Um, and I was a swimming instructor and I spent many, many hours in a chlorinated pool. And if you've spent a fair bit of time in the pool, what happens to your skin? It goes gross. I had very supple hands. Clarissa used to like holding my hand. She used to like me giving her a massage, but not anymore. Those days are over. I can scratch her back now without using my nails. (laughs) That's gross. So I used, to, I, used to, I used to have very supple hands. And anyway, one day my father needed me to come out and help him build a retaining wall. And so under sufferance at the age of 18, I did that. And I thought I'd really man up and, and not wear gloves. And so about three sleepers in, I lodge a splinter about so big into my, into my palm. Being the man that I was, and the thought process that all men have is, it'll work its way out. Good medical advice, that. I did pull it out, but I, I spent no time cleaning it out. And I, I went through the rest of the day, and I, I worked hard, and I thought, gee, I've, I've got myself a war wound. Anyway, about three weeks later, I noticed that the war wound was starting to become red. And uh, there was a nice little reservoir of let's just say, liquid underneath the skin. <laughs> underneath this, ah, oh, there we go. Underneath the skin. I thought I'd lost it somewhere. About that. Anyway, it, it was getting gross. So what did I do? Nothing. I thought it'd just work its way out. Anyway, two weeks later, my hand has doubled in size nearly, and it's significantly infected. And what I, when I went to the doctor and what I found out was that the coating or the treatment of the retaining wall sleepers is not um, copper like it is today, it was arsenic. That's what they used to do that. It's like you know, the great you know, benefits of asbestos and silica dust and all those sorts of things. 
So they used to coat it in arsenic. And so that was lodged in my skin. And because I didn't, he goes, did you clean it? I said, no. Did you disinfect it? No. Did you put a Band-Aid on it? No. And so therefore, the infection, what was a small speck of a little bit of leftover timber in my hand turned into a significant infection. See, if I had dealt with the issue straight away, I wouldn't have had it. I would have been able to clean the wound and we would have been able to move on. But because I decided to do things in my own strength and I thought I knew best, I started to rationalise my decisions. See, this is what happens. The first stage of spiritual erosion is rationalisation. We start to compromise on what we know. I mean, what we know is true. See, as we look at this passage of Scripture, in verses 28 of Judges chapter 1, it says this, When the Israelites grew stronger, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they never did drive them out. You see, they thought that they could rationalise their, their decision-making by making them work as slaves. But it wasn't the full obedience that God had required. It was partial. It's like when we ask our kids to do something. Hey, mate, have you, have you picked up and cleaned up your room? I've gone to the toilet. Well, that's not what I've asked you to do. I've washed the dishes. Yes, but that's not what I asked you to do either. And what do we do? We make excuses. We make excuses without identifying the sin in our life. And what happens is all of a sudden, if we don't deal with the sin, if we don't deal with the infection, it starts to grow. It starts to unravel. Very easily, we can rationalise every decision that we make. We can make an excuse for every little bit of something in our life rather than laying ourselves before Jesus and saying, Lord Jesus, deal with what's in here. Yeah. See, I can, I can rationalise the fact that I could be rude towards people because I'm shy. I could rationalise the fact that I don't like to necessarily move out of my comfort zone and so therefore I'm not going to go and say hello. I can rationalise that decision very easily. But it's not the obedience that God's called me to do. Yeah. God's called me to be obedient. He hasn't called me to rationalise and compromise on the things that he's got for me and you. See, the people of Israel thought that they were doing the merciful thing. You've got to remember they had spent 40 years in the wilderness and then they had spent another X amount of time, I'm not exactly sure how long, continuing to fight. They were weary. They were starting to get tired. And when people start, and when we all start to get tired, what happens? We let our guards down and our emotions rise. And so all of a sudden, all of a sudden we're making not quite the best decisions. See, I believe the Israelites thought that they were being merciful. Hey, instead of clearing them right out, what we'll do is we'll make treaties with them. And if we make treaties with them, maybe we can sort of win them over. But deep down, deep down they knew that if they didn't obey and obey completely, it was going to spiral into some sort of disaster. And unfortunately, that's where it started. It was the rationalisation of their disobedience that started this course of spiritual erosion. You may have heard of the, the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. How often have we heard that saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I look at the intentions of the Israelites here and they, I believe that their intentions may have been good. I don't believe that they were deliberately disobedient. But because they were, their intentions may have been good, it doesn't mean that the path that it leads to is going to be any better. Good intentions may mean well, but they can ultimately lead in disaster. Let's take, for example, the iPhone. What was supposed to be an incredible device to make people's life easier, more streamlined. You could, you could continue to, to make calls, but only not only make calls, but you could operate as a computer, send emails, and, and keep life moving fairly swiftly all of a sudden has been, become a device that we can now not live without. 
That's probably causing um, more depression, more anxiety amongst young people than ever before because of social media, because of those things that cause people to think that they can't live without not knowing what's going on in the world. We have the world in our pockets. We have more knowledge than ever before, but we are so much further away from where God wants us. Good intentions don't necessarily lead to good results. The second, the second thing that is part or is that stage of spiritual erosion is when we reject what God has. The people of Israel rejected God's work and he rejected and they rejected him and not only him, but the faithful things he had done in the past. See, when Pastor Mike read Psalm 103 before, how often do we forget the good things that God has done for us in the past. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says this. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said to the Israelites, I brought you out of Egypt into this land that I swore to give your ancestors. And I said, I would never break my covenant with you. And now hear this. It says this. For your part, you were not to make any covenants with the people living in this land. Instead, you were to destroy their altars, but you disobeyed my commands. Why did you do this? So now I declare that I will no longer drive out the people of your land. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a constant temptation to you. See, when we reject or neglect the things that God has done, It's very easy for us to move forward without any focus. If we forget to look back, we do fail to look forward. If we forget to remember the things that God has done in our life, sometimes we forget to look forward to what the promises are that he has for us. Clarissa and I have been going on a little bit of a journey where we've been looking for a house to purchase. And what happens is is I found myself in this cycle, this exact cycle of forgetting the things that God has done for me in the past, where he's provided, where he's opened doors, where he's made a way. And what happens is I've been moving into this realm or this position of I can do this on my own. Because I have forgotten the things that God has done for me in the past, where he provided 12 years ago for us as a family, a house out of nowhere. When he did that, we were so thankful. When he acts in the moment, we are so thankful. But how quickly we move past that and we neglect the promises of times gone by. How quickly we've gone, okay, now that I'm moving forward and I remember these things, uh, but I'm still going to try and do it on my own anyway. It's human nature. It's a cycle of the human condition. The frightening thing that we see is that when we forget to look back and remember, that's why throughout the entire Old Testament, you see nearly every author of an Old Testament book say, mention the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. Not only did he bring them out of Egypt, but he provided for them in in the wilderness. And they say, remember when I bought you out of Egypt. Remember when I provided the manna from heaven. Remember when I did all those things. They had to be constantly reminded of God's goodness so they could understand his promises. We constantly have to be reminded of God's goodness. See, if we take this, that's why we do communion. We do communion on a Sunday, every Sunday, because we want to come back to what Christ did for us on the cross. If we forget that, If we ever take it for granted, what happens is we become a little bit loose. We don't stay on the path that God's got for us. We we tend to wander. But when we remember, we can remember not only the things he's done, but the promises he's got for us ahead. On a slightly separate note, but linked that's why I think it's incredibly important that if you are an adult, which most of you are are in this room. The next generation is key. 
Judges chapter, 10, uh, Judges chapter 2, verses 10 says this. After that generation died, so the generation of Joshua and Caleb, another ge- generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done. It took one generation. One generation. That's a period of 30 to 40 years for them not to remember the good things that God had done for them. I encourage every adult in this room, and if you're a parent particularly, train your children in the ways that they should go. If you're an adult in this room, you have a responsibility to help train, to speak into the next generation. If you're a parent, take this to the bank. Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 9. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you are going to bed, and when you are getting up. Tie them on your hands and wear them on your forehead as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. Pretty much every part of your day, sow it into your kids. Because if the next generation don't know the goodness and the promises of God, it's going to fall away. The church, not just this church, but the church, has a greater responsibility to speak into the lives of the next generation, to mentor and to disciple. We have a lot of followers, but not a lot of disciples. There's a lot of followers, but not a lot of disciples. We need to step up, step in. If there's a parenting course to go to, get to it. If there is a marriage course to get to, get to it. If there's an opportunity to speak into the lives of children at Wild Kids, TG Kids, RI, whatever the case is, your words could bring life. Your words could bring incredible influence to a child or a youth that may feel that their life is done. We must look towards the next generation and instill Christ in them. So don't forget the good things that God has done. Tell the stories to your children about what God has done in your life. Help them remember the things that... Tell them, do you remember? Do you remember when? When you do that, it stirs up their own faith. But you're training your children in the ways that they should go. So we've got rationalisation. We can compromise if we want to. We've got just, as in, we can justify our actions. If we don't be careful and stop it there, we can, it can lead to the next stage, which is rejection or neglecting of the former things. And the third stage is we can possibly renounce or abandon our God. Judges chapter 2, verse 11 to 15 says this. The Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who, what, brought them out of Egypt. They went after the gods, worshipping the gods of the people around them. And they angered the Lord, and they abandoned the Lord to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. This made the Lord burn with anger against Israel. So he handed them over to the raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. Every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated, just as he had warned. And the people were in great distress. That word abandon in the New King James or the original um, text is is forsook, pretty much to cut away, to desert, to run away, to turn your back on. The Israelites at this stage had rationalised their decisions. They had then rejected God's goodness and his promises and the things he had done in the past, and they were moving into this stage of renouncing and abandoning who God was. 
the role that he had in their life. They turned their back on him. It's a very, very interesting sequence of events that happens through the book of Judges. What happens is at the very start, God's voice is quite clear. As you move towards the end of the book, it's very rarely there. See, erosion is silent and erosion is subtle. And if you don't, and if we don't bring ourselves to a point of understanding some of these stages, very quickly, very quickly, things can become out of control and it can spiral towards depravity. See, when we rationalize, when we reject, this leads us to abandonment and we fail to hear God's voice. There was a lack of leadership. The next generation after Joshua and Caleb didn't have the leaders that they needed to keep the people in line. What we need to do is to, do, to continue to remember who God is so that we do not move away from the promises that he has for us. Unlike physical erosion, which once it starts, it can never stop. Physical erosion, if you were to go down to the Great Ocean Road in Victoria, shows the cliff faces and what were once the 12 apostles. There are now five of them. Because what happened is over the years, the wind, the waves, the storms, and those things have just eaten away slowly but surely at the base of those apostles or those rocks. There's now five of them, I think, if that. And because over the years, it has slowly just whittled its way. And then all of a sudden, it's just toppled over. When physical erosion starts, it's very hard for it to be restored. However, the great thing about serving a God in heaven is that yes. spiritual erosion can be restored. Yeah. See, we go from maybe cycles or spirals towards depravity, but God's got his own. He's got his own cycles. See, where you might think that you're broken and that you are lost and that there is no way back, God has another plan. This is what God does. If we repent, he redeems. When he redeems, he rescues. And when he rescues, he restores. I'm going to say that again. When we repent, he redeems. He rescues and he restores. And when I say that he restores and brings us back to the original condition, you know what usually happens? He usually brings us back to a condition that's better than the original. Uh, where's Rod? Rod's not here. I think he's, he's in with kids. But uh, if you don't know Rod, he is a mechanic and he restores hot rods. And he takes these old beaten up cars and he restores them, and they are far better than the original. He's patient. He's slow to anger. You've got to be. He has an eye for detail. He makes sure that every element of that car is better than what it was before. There's not an ounce of rust. There's barely any dust. It is meticulous because he understands when it's to be restored back to its original condition, for it to be restored back to its original condition is not enough. It has to go to another level. It has to be restored better than the original. That's what God does with us. You may think that you're too far gone. You may think that as I've gone, I'm spiraling out of control and there's no way for anything to stop this, but God can. It's what Jesus did on the cross for us. See, the great picture I see through the book of Judges is that although the people were horrendous, it's like looking in a mirror because that's exactly what I am. I might not go to the levels of depravity of the same lengths, but my cycle is exactly the same as the cycle of the people of Israel. My sin causes me to separate. I rationalize my own sin, and then if I'm not careful... 
If I don't check myself, come back to a pl place of renewing and restoring, what happens is I could easily start to reject some of those little things. See, it's not big things, it's small things. It's a small infection. It's a little bit of yeast that goes into the lump of dough. If we don't address it early, it can start to infect the whole batch. But God's got another plan. God has his plans of when we repent, he redeems, he rescues, and he restores. Acts chapter 3 says this, verses 19 to 21. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. It says there, repent, and it becomes wiped away. Wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. God has his own cycles. God has his own plans. God's mercy and grace is so abundant that if he could continue to rescue a group of people like the Israelites, he can rescue us. Yeah. His mercy and his love is so incredible. Again, they're those words that we've, we've said very liberally, mercy and grace and love. And, and have we taken the time have we taken the time to really understand that mercy means we get what we don't deserve? We get life when we deserve death. That's what mercy is. And grace is the unmerited favour of God. Favour that is a free gift. Blessing that is a free gift. Do you know why? Because all we did was trust and obey. We trust and obey that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He died on the cross for each and every one of us. David the psalmist in Psalm 51 said this, from verses 7 to 17, and I'm going to end here. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. I give back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. And then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding the blood, for shedding blood, O God, who saves then I will be joyfully singing your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire sacrifice, or I would give one. You do not want burnt offerings. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not, you will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. That's coming from the man who had just committed adultery, who then went and killed the husband of the woman he slept with. The thing that comes to mind when I see this passage of Scripture and I see everything that David wrote down was that he understood the mercy and the grace of our Heavenly Father, that all he had to do was say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Heavenly Father, I repent. This morning, you may feel that you're too far gone or you are starting to notice a few things in your world where you've blurred the lines. This morning is an opportunity for us to repent because he just needs a broken heart, a broken spirit, a true repentant heart because then that starts the process of restoration. That's the process that starts to begin. It's not going to be easy and it's going to be slow, but God does restore. And do you know what? He restores back to better than the original. 
if you're here this morning and you need to deal with a few things in your world, if you need to come before the cross and lay it at his feet, I'd be happy to pray with you this morning. But why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes. If you're also here this morning and and you don't know who Jesus is, you're wandering a path of your own desires, you're wandering wandering a path of your own plans and you haven't been prepared to, to submit. There's chaos going in your world, there's anxiety going on. Jesus can restore and will restore. I'd be more than happy to pray with you after the service. I'll be waiting at the, at the front. But as I conclude in prayer, let's deal with these things that are in our life. Let's, let's remove all the leaven. Let's take all the yeast out. Let's remove any course of infection in our hearts. And let's deal and do some, uh, do some time with the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we honour you in this place. We honour you. We glorify you. We say thank you for who you are. We thank you for all the good things that you've done in our life. We thank you for the promises that you have fulfilled. We remember, Lord Jesus, what it means to come back to our first love, which is you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, help us not to rationalise or compromise in our faith, in our walk, in what your word says, that your word is truth and your word is life. And Lord Jesus, help us to remember that you will restore us back to the full. That all we need, Lord Jesus, is a broken and repentant heart. And from that place, you can do amazing things. So Heavenly Father, we want to give you all the praise and glory. We lift you up in this place and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Like I said, I'm happy to pray with anyone who needs prayer. Uh, I'll be down the front. But for the rest of us, why don't you have a great day? Why don't you join us for tea and coffee out in the deck? And we look forward to seeing you next week. Bless you all.